Have you ever looked up at the moon and wondered who owns that celestial body? This question might seem a little out of the ordinary, but in the world of space exploration, it's a hot topic. Ownership of the moon or any celestial body for that matter is a complex issue that's shrouded in mystery. It's a puzzle that has intrigued scientists, lawyers, and space enthusiasts alike. On the one hand, you have the vastness of space, seemingly open and free for all. On the other, you have Earth, where every inch of land has an owner. So, how does ownership work when it comes to the moon? Now, you may have heard that it's possible to purchase a slice of lunar real estate. There are websites that claim you can own a plot of land on the moon for a small fee. Sounds like a great deal, right? Well, hold on to your wallets because that's a common misconception. In reality, the idea that you can buy a piece of the moon is nothing more than a myth. It's a clever marketing ploy, a novelty gift, but legally speaking, it holds no weight. The certificates of ownership these companies provide are not recognized by any government entity or international organization. They're essentially just souvenirs. This misconception stems from a misunderstanding of space law. Yes, you heard it right. There's a whole field of law dedicated to outer space. It's a fascinating area, full of complex questions about ownership, jurisdiction and responsibility. But if individuals can't own the moon, then who does? The answer to that question is not as straightforward as you might think. It's a topic that requires a deep dive into international treaties, legal principles and the emerging field of space law. So, if individuals cannot own the moon, who does? Let's delve into the world of space law to find out. Space law, a concept as vast and complex as the universe itself, governs our celestial explorations. It's the cornerstone of our ventures into the cosmos, the rulebook that determines how we explore, use, and indeed, claim what's out there beyond our planet. So, what exactly is space law? Well, think of it as the legal framework for space exploration. It's a collection of agreements, treaties, and principles created by the international community to ensure the orderly use of outer space. It's about promoting peace and cooperation in the vast expanse of the cosmos. Now, let's travel back in time to the mid-20th century, a time when the world was gripped by the space race. It was the era of Sputnik and Apollo, a time when humanity was taking its first bold steps into the universe. Amid this backdrop, the United Nations stepped in to ensure that our space explorations were conducted responsibly and peacefully. Thus, the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 was born. The Outer Space Treaty, or more formally, the Treaty on Principles Governing the Activities of States in the Exploration and Use of Outer Space, including the Moon and other celestial bodies, is the Magna Carta of Space Law. It lays down the fundamental principles of space exploration, such as the peaceful use of outer space, the prohibition of weapons of mass destruction in space, and the notion that space exploration should benefit all mankind. But the most intriguing part of this treaty, and the one most pertinent to our discussion, is Article 2. It states, in no uncertain terms, that outer space, including the Moon and other celestial bodies, is not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. Simply put, no country can claim ownership of the Moon or any other celestial body. So according to the Outer Space Treaty, no one can claim ownership of the Moon. But what exactly does that mean? The Outer Space Treaty, a cornerstone of space law, has some interesting things to say about Moon ownership. The Outer Space Treaty, officially known as the Treaty on Principles, governing the activities of states in the exploration and use of outer space, including the Moon and other celestial bodies, is a fundamental piece of legislation in space law. It was signed into existence in the year 1967 during the height of the space race and has since been ratified by over 100 countries. Now, let's delve into the fascinating provisions of this treaty. One of the most significant aspects of the Outer Space Treaty is its prohibition on the national appropriation of outer space, including the Moon, and other celestial bodies. What does this mean, 
you ask? Simply put, it means that no country can claim sovereignty over the moon or any other celestial body. Think of it as an imaginary line drawn around the Earth's orbit, beyond which the usual rules of territorial possession do not apply. No nation can plant its flag on the moon and declare it as their territory, as you might do on Earth. This prohibition extends not only to claims by sovereignty, but also by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. So, if no nation can claim the moon, who does it belong to? The Outer Space Treaty provides an answer to this question. It establishes that the exploration and use of outer space shall be carried out for the benefit of all countries, and that outer space is the province of all mankind. In essence, the Outer Space Treaty creates a common heritage of mankind principle for outer space. This principle implies that outer space and celestial bodies, including the moon, are not subject to national appropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means of use or occupation, or by any other means. But how does this work in practice? Well, that's a whole other can of worms. Stay tuned as we continue to unravel the mysteries of moon ownership in the next segment. The theory of space law is one thing, but how does it play out in the real world of space exploration and utilization. Let's take a journey through history and look at some notable space missions and activities. These examples will help us understand how the principles of the Outer Space Treaty have been applied in practice. First, let's go back to July 20th, 1969. The world held its breath as Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, astronauts from Apollo 11, set foot on the moon. It was a milestone in human history a testament to our technological prowess. However, even though the United States planted a flag on the lunar surface, it was not a claim of ownership. Rather, it was a symbolic gesture of achievement. Fast forward to the 21st century, where we've seen a flurry of lunar rovers from different nations. These robotic vehicles, sent by countries like the United States, China and India, have explored the moon's surface, collecting valuable data. But again, these missions do not imply ownership. They abide by the principle of peaceful exploration outlined in the Outer Space Treaty. Let's also consider the Google Lunar X Prize. This global competition, launched in the mid-2000s, challenged private entities to land a robotic spacecraft on the moon. The competition ended without a clear winner, but it sparked a new era of commercial interest in lunar exploration. Despite this, the principle of non-appropriation remains intact. The competition was about innovation and exploration, not about staking claims. So, while we've seen various activities on the moon, from manned missions to robotic rovers to private enterprise competitions, none of these have challenged the fundamental principles of the Outer Space Treaty. They've been about exploration, about pushing the boundaries of human knowledge and capability. Despite these activities, the principle of non-appropriation stands firm. The moon remains the common heritage of all mankind. As we look to the future, the question of moon ownership becomes even more complex and fascinating. With advancements in technology and space exploration, the moon is no longer a distant dream, but a potential frontier for human civilization. Imagine for a moment a future where we have lunar bases, where astronauts live and work. Picture a bustling industry of lunar mining, extracting valuable resources like helium-3, an isotope that could potentially fuel clean nuclear fusion reactors. It's a future that seems plucked from the pages of a science fiction novel, but it's a future that is rapidly becoming a possibility. But what does this mean for the law? The Outer Space Treaty, signed in the mid-20th century, did not foresee such advancements. It prohibits nations from claiming sovereignty over celestial bodies, but it doesn't address the activities of private companies. As the likes of SpaceX and Blue Origin push the boundaries of the possible, we find ourselves in uncharted legal territory. This future presents not only technological challenges, but legal ones too. How do we manage these resources? Who has the rights to mine the moon? What happens when the first lunar base is established? 
These are questions that we as a global community will need to answer as we step into this new era of space exploration. As we continue to reach for the stars, the moon remains a symbol of our common heritage, unowned and free for all mankind to explore and admire. So, who owns the moon? The answer is both simple and complex. We've journeyed together through the mysteries of space law and unraveled the enigma of the Outer Space Treaty. We've discovered that this celestial body, shimmering in our night sky, is not a commodity to be owned, but a common heritage of mankind. It's a testament to our collective quest for knowledge and exploration. In the end, the moon belongs to all of us, a celestial symbol of our shared humanity and our shared destiny in the cosmos.